was that I was new to Fort Worth and was doing oral history research. I've been doing research for my dissertation at Duke uh, for a long time before that. It included somewhere around 100 interviews with African Americans, Mexican Americans, and other activists uh, from the civil rights era. And so I was doing that work once I came to TCU. I'm, I was uh, doing it with my students. We started collecting interviews in the Fort Worth area in those different communities. And I reached out to some of my friends and, and colleagues in the area uh, who were also doing work in civil rights history. So Marvin Delaney, who's down at the end here, uh, professor of history at, at UT Arlington, and um, uh, someone who'd been involved working on African-American history, mostly in Dallas and around Texas, uh, chair of the history department there as well. Todd Moy, who uh, is a professor of history at the University of North Texas and uh, a well-known civil rights historian and runs the UNT oral history program. And Jose Angel Gutierrez, who's here with us, who, uh, uh, in addition to being a movement icon, had run the uh, Tejano Voices project at the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, and it had helped me along, a lot along my way uh, in developing as a scholar. And so together we came together and started talking about how we could collaborate, not step on each other's toes, and continue to uh, expand the project, how we might um, do oral history work and make that oral history work available to a larger public. Uh, and, and there were several problems um, that I had identified, I think, early on that, that we, I, and I shared with these collaborators, that if we're gonna go ahead and collect, well, we need to find a way to do it together. We need to collaborate. Uh, we need to find a way to scale it, hopefully, around the state. And that means we need money to help us do that. Uh, and we need to try to address some of the issues with oral history research generally, right? Uh, and those aren't as much about the veracity of sources because I'm not concerned about that. Uh, I don't think oral history is any less useful in evidence than other forms of historical evidence or that the archives any more constructive or anything like that. Um, but, but rather that what often happens with oral history research is people go out and conduct the interviews and then the interviews disappear, right? They get, they get archived maybe, uh, they sometimes get transcribed, they get, um, in, in the best of cases, they are put in some kind of online project where they stream as a full interview, uh, but they're not easy to work with. They're not easy to, to find for, for most people, and they're really not easy for the general public to use, right? If you're a scholar and you have time to sift through hours and hours of interviews, pages and pages of transcripts, you might find what you're looking for. Um, but for the general public, for teachers, for journalists, for lawyers, for educators, uh, for undergraduates, um, for people who are looking for narrow information on a very narrowly defined subject, um, they're very difficult to use. Right? You might be able to look through a couple transcripts, but you can't find everything related to, say, sit-ins in Tyler, Texas, or, um, or if we wanted to say black-brown relations at, at the work site in Houston, right? At, you can't find information across an entire collection from a variety of different speakers. And so we came up with this web platform that was built by the people at TCU's digital library um, that w tries to address some of that, and you'll, you can kind of see how it works. Um, so we went out and did the research, and we're, we're, that's an ongoing project, and then we, we also built this website that displays, instead of full interviews, clips from the interviews. And uh, each clip has its own, uh, its own subject data, metadata, um, right, with a controlled vocabulary of terms, as well as tags that, that you, as users, could add or, or that we add during processing. So, you know, this one deals with low-income housing, and if I were to click on that, you would see other clips that deal with low-income housing, and then you could filter it by place and so forth, and I'll just invite you all to go to the website and play with the search functionality on your own. Um, but our hope is that this is gonna make this information much more accessible than comparable oral history projects or civil rights <coughs> history projects, and therefore much more useful to the world at large. Um, so, uh, that's all I'm gonna say about the technology of it. Um, we were very lucky to get support from a number of uh, different sources from our institutions. We started this website by uploading interviews from our existing collections, you know, from my book project, from Marvin's project, from Jose Angel's project, from Todd Moy's work at UNT. Um, and then this past summer, with support from the Brown Foundation and the Summerlee Foundation, we hired this group of people here to go out and do interviews all summer long. And, um, they did it full time, they spent a couple months in the field, um, and they came back with about 115 new interviews, all of them video recorded. Uh, they went, uh, one group to the, to, uh, the Rio Grande Valley, uh, to Laredo and to El Paso, and another group to uh, all sorts of backwaters in East Texas, <laughs> um, but also Tyler, Longview, um, Marshall, Brian, 
Hempstead, Huntsville, um, so all over that region. And, and so we're, we're interested in looking at the two civil rights movements, the African American Civil Rights Movement and sort of the Long Chicano Movement. We're interested in looking at them comparatively and also relationally, right, looking at black-brown relations. And the sites that we covered this summer, there wasn't a whole lot of those relations, and you'll hear a little bit about that. Um, in the urban areas, there's much more, and, and, and kind of along the Gulf Coast, there's much more of that history, and we're gonna continue to, to uncover that. Uh, we received a grant from the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities, a collaborative research grant to keep working on it, and so next summer we'll be hiring many more grad students and going out um, and, and conducting research at many more sites as we, as we move forward. So um, that's it, I think, in the way of introductions. Uh, this is really a first look from the field. Uh, we haven't gotten together since August. We haven't really talked at all about it, uh, but each of, the, each of the students to my left have compiled uh, some piece of this story, and it's a very much a work in progress, uh, both in terms of our, our collecting of data, our analyzing it, uh, and, and our getting the information up on the website. So that's a work in progress, too. But do feel free to visit it at crbb.tcu.edu, and feel free to do whatever you want with what you find there, right? It's all open access. Um, full interviews will be at the Portal to Texas History. So with that, I'll just introduce uh, my, my co-panelists. So immediately to my left is Moises Acuna Gorola. Uh, Mo is uh, finishing his master's, actually just defended his master's thesis at the University of North Texas uh, under the direction of Beto Calderon and Todd Moy and others. Uh, and he's applying to PhD programs and going to go on and do great things. He wrote a thesis about um, the Molina neighborhood of Corpus Christi where he also grew up. Um, and that's a story that included uh, the Chicano movement, but also um, African-American history. Uh, to his left is David Robles. Uh, David is uh, a native of the Valley uh, who is now pursuing a PhD at the University of Texas at El Paso. Uh, and David's working on a dissertation about the Far Riot uh, and the Chicano movement and, and sort of moving forward in, in Far Texas. And he'll tell us a little bit about that today. P-H-R-R-R, yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> South Texas. Yeah. Uh, Catherine Bynum uh, is a doctoral student at TCU, uh, where she's doing work with me and others on, uh, on women's history and civil rights in Dallas, Texas, and looking at a multiracial history of civil women and, and uh, civil rights organizing in Dallas. Uh, and to her left is Sandra Enriquez. Sandra is finishing a dissertation very soon here under the direction of Monica Perales at University of Houston. Uh, and Sandra is doing really cool work on, uh, on El Paso and on the Chicano movement and the years since the Chicano movement in El Paso and struggles over urban renewal, uh, neighborhood revitalization, in quotes, uh, and, and community control of that process. Uh, and then finally, Marvin Delaney, my colleague, uh, department chair at UT Arlington uh, of history um, and we'll just go from there. So we'll, we, we don't have a lot of time for this many people to speak, so we're gonna move quickly and hopefully be able to play some clips from the website for you all, uh, and then, and then uh, try to save a little time for questions. So, Mo, you're up first. Um, hi. Um, so I, I uh, was really interested in Bryan College Station, one of the sites that we had visited. Um, uh, it wasn't after I watched some of these interviews that I started to sort of um, reimagine how I do my own history and how, how I think maybe a lot of us should probably start doing as well. Um, and this may seem obvious, but a lot of times when we look for black, brown political coalitions, whenever we don't find one, and I, I can't speak for everyone who does similar work, but I know um, a lot of times we kind of just skip over that area um, and we just sort of, sort of see, oh, no, coalitions are right, next and kind of move on. Um, but, and I know this may seem obvious, but before that, any of that can happen, we need to get a, a real understanding of uh, how the two groups got along with, with one another. Um, and if they did, and if they were even exposed to one another, and if they shared spaces. Um, so um, a lot of historians have argued that cultural dissimilarities, geographic distance, class distinctions, and political affiliations uh, resulted in an overwhelming uh, lack of black-brown unity across Texas. But when we kind of um, further the microscope on like smaller spaces, uh, where there was no significant uh, geographic distance and no real difference in class distinctions, uh, we see where a place where cultural dissimilarities are embraced, um, uh, and uh, which allow uh, the formation of political affiliations. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is they need to get to know one another um, before any political coalitions could exist, and we should really take notice of how important those sort of exchanges are. So 
I have a, one clip from uh, Velma Spivey. She's a retired social worker, um, and she's a curator of the Brussels Valley African American uh, Museum. And she talks about sort of that uh, first, um, I, I guess from her point of view, uh, the relationship between uh, the two groups um, when she was working out in the, in the, in the cotton fields. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, she describes uh, what the colonias look like. We, in the interview, we say um, labor camps. Um, but we would just understand them as, as colonias now. Um, and she sort of even talks about that initial sort of tension that exists between groups when the two groups do not know each other. Um, so, um, Which one? parental, there, starting from 313. Right. How did your parents meet? Did they ever share that with you? I think uh, my mom, when my mom was born, white people in, uh, in Iraq. What about Latinos? When was the first time you met a uh, Mexican-American or Tejano, Mexicano, however they just self-identified at, uh, at any particular time? You know what? I, I, we, didn't, we didn't have Hispanic people in our, in our, in our community. There were no white people either. But then we didn't... I, I was a young mother. I was a mother. And my children had friends who were Hispanic. And they were in, in the neighborhood. Uh, as they were homeowners, uh, and my children were um, uh, friends with them, even as head start. Um, uh, so there was one lady who would bring her kids over in the morning time for me to take to head start, and, and and they would exchange. She would come. They would bring the kids to my house, like two, two or three of them, and my kids would have, you know, cereal and maybe some bacon and eggs or something like that. These kids would have tacos. They traded breakfasts. My children didn't have tacos. You know, uh, I didn't know how to make tacos. I didn't know nothing about them. So we were introduced. Probably, I was introduced to Hispanic people about the time my kids did. Uh, I don't remember in, in uh, growing up. Uh, if, if, if we saw one, we just say, uh, you know, they don't speak our same language, so we don't know what they're saying and, and stuff. And, and even when we were going to the field, we were like, we were like uh, segregated in the field. We didn't, we didn't pick a chop cotton along beside Hispanic people. You know, we were, we were in this field up here, and they were in that field up there. So they dressed a little bit differently than us for the field. Strange thing, we had our attire. Uh, we always had on a hat and a, a you know, long sleeve or whatever. And and see, like they sometimes they had on hats, but they would always have a rag or something on their head. And and, and uh, we I don't know why we didn't have something to keep the sweat out of our eyes or whatever, because they just put it up about the sweat. But uh, we didn't, and, and we would see them on the trucks, okay, from the south of the store to get some refreshments. That we didn't call them refreshments back then, though, but we saw them in the store to get some refreshments. We, we would see them, they didn't speak to us, we didn't speak to them. And we didn't know what they were saying anyway. So I, I don't know who thought somebody was better. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we thought we were better. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and because uh, it would be more of them at the field than it would be us. Um, so her discussion uh, kind of goes on to a next clip, but um, just to save time, we'll just go ahead. Um, you can look it up. It's called Hispanic and Immigrant Work Conditions. Um, she goes into further detail on that. So uh, um, as much as Black Brown was a topic in our interviews in Bryan and College Station, uh, we were unfortunately unable to speak to a lot of Latinos who were there for you know one reason or another. Um, but we still were able to get a sense of what the Latino community looked like in Bryan um, from the perspective of African-American residents. Um, and in this next clip, uh, Robert Person uh, discusses what a lot of uh, uh, the, the team in the Valley were able to um, uh, get interviews to talk about, and that's speaking Spanish in schools. Um, we, I wasn't expecting at least to hear about this, um, but I did, um, and from uh, Robert Person. Beginning. From the beginning to the That's when they started coming up with it that we were going through some of the plights and we was going through some of the Hispanic students was going through the same thing even though they were allowed to go to Stephen F. Austin 
it was like, you know, hey, we're letting you in here, but you and to the point where they couldn't even speak their native language, you know. They didn't speak Spanish at school. Um, I, I imagine that causes some problems later for them because you're speaking it at home, but when you get to school, you, you can't do it. But they adjusted, and when Little League was one of the things that made us realize that because we had all black team, had all Hispanic team, had all white team, but you had more white teams than you had black and Hispanic team. So <laughs> as a result of it, we usually had the better athletes on the uh, black teams and the Hispanic team. And when I was playing Little League, you know, I was. Um, and so he goes on about segregation and sort of, in, in the next clip, uh, you can also look it up, uh, his, it's called Hispanic Neighborhoods in Bryan, interview with Robert Person. Um, he sort of talks about the, 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 there was still segregation in Bryan, but it was the black and brown communities that were desegregating, and yet the Anglo uh, population was still disconnected from uh, that part of, uh, of, the, of the city. Um, so in talking about, I guess, culture and social uh, interactions leading up to political uh, coalitions, I want to skip a few uh, decades and sort of end up to our then present. Um, and the interesting thing about oral histories is that they serve multiple purposes. They're kind of a, a you know, time capsule for what was going on at that particular time. It's more than just a recollection of you know, previous dates, um, but also we get a sense of what was happening on the day of the interview itself. Um, and that can help us a lot in the future, especially with this one. Uh, Al Sines is talking about um, um, sort of uh, work between black and brown communities um, for, I guess, more social justice-oriented stuff. Um, and you can start to clip that one. So what about um, yeah. organizations with part of, and, and I give a lot of credit to Councilman Rafael Peña. He's, a, he's, a, he's a, the councilman for district two, but <coughs> the African-American district. It still is, predominantly. But uh, he he wanted over over an African American. In a way, District One, which is the district that I represent in the city of Bryan, was designed to be one in many ways by Hispanic because of the the, the the predominant population. The dominant population in that area is Hispanic. Makes sense. District Two, African American. Makes sense. Uh, this year, or last year, Councilman Pena wanted, wanted an African-American district, and he's Hispanic. But it's only because uh, the previous councilman, who was African-American, really didn't listen to the issues that were important to the African-American community. And so, uh, uh, Councilman Pena was able to, to, to come in and win it, because he's a better candidate as well. So what, what he started, and what I, well, we both started at the same time, but he had it there at the African American Museum. We started our, uh, our monthly town hall meeting. And I used to have mine at the library. I had about three at the library. And he, he had his at the African American Museum. And so uh, we decided, because he was getting more people than I were at, at, at his than I was at mine, I said, you know, Councilman, let me join you over there. And so what we started is a monthly uh, town hall meeting at the African American Museum that brings the Hispanic district and the African American district together to discuss local lo local issues pertaining to uh, city services and government. Um, so yeah, to wrap up, um, I think it's really important for us to not overlook sort of um, the social and cultural things that go on between the two communities because eventually, the, whatever we're looking for, the political coalitions. Um, they grow out of that, those initial, you know, that initial contact into something more like this. Um, so yeah, I think I think we should just find more value in, in seeing the <coughs> you know, social and cultural things. Thank you. Yeah, we can go now. Uh, well, um, my name is Diego Robles. Uh, I was uh, part of Team B, which visited the Valley, Laredo, and El Paso, along with you know Sandra was also in the team. But um, like Dr. Krogman said, uh, my research focuses more on the far right in 1971 and. I want to expand on just stopping in 1975, where most of the studies have stopped, and continue on this community study of what happened in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, you know, how the city grew and how everything changed after the riot. So when I was offered this position, I, I said yes, you know, and uh, because, I mean, there, I knew a lot of people in the Valley that would be interested in the project. And uh, throughout the you know, project, I kind of found this one theme uh, with some of the major, well, major individuals when we were interviewing the Valley in Laredo. 
is that the the city of Kingsville, Texas, was kind of like a mecca for Chicano ideologies in the 1970s, especially for Kingsville and I. You know, uh, you know, we have uh, Israel Reyes who works in Laredo now in a nonprofit organization who attended there. Uh, Rogelio Nunez, Efraín Fernández, who was a leader of the far ri- of the of the far protest in 1971 that led to a riot. So, you know, I was start thinking, you know, okay, how do they all relate to each other? But not only that, but how do their ideologies, you know, kind of, you know, kind of not agree with one another? Like Mr. Um, what's his name, Narciso Aleman, you know, who has a very distinct view on Ch- the Chicano movement. And then one of our many interviews with him, we had like about four interviews with him during the summer. Uh, first one was an informal at a cafe. And, you know, he, that Saturday he talked so much about the Chicano ideology, the differences between Texas, California, New Mexico, and Colorado. And we just, it was such a shame we didn't get it, you know, on tape. Uh, but in this, one of the videos that we're gonna, I'm going to show you right now, um, he talks about, you know, the dissension between him and Jose Angel Gutierrez at times, you know, and some of his political viewpoints. Uh, if you want to. The beginning? Yeah. Okay. The other thing, of course, is that, for example, uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez, uh, um, because it was majority based, taught them. Taught and thought, taught and thought of elections in terms of winning. Corky, because he was a minority and couldn't win, thought of it in terms of philosophy, in terms of principles, in terms of values. And, and, and you know, to be consistent and, and to uphold and live those values, those standards. Okay? Uh, so, so those were some. Those were some of the differences, and um, having had a socialization and conditioning that was based on principles, I was closer to the philosophy of being principled and being consistent. You know, so, so, so that appealed more to me, to a large extent because of the religious beliefs and practices of my father, you know, who, who as a Jehovah's Witness, believed that he was not of this world, that neither was his family, that we should not socialize with the rest of this world, that, that, that the reward and the promise was, you know, in the hereafter. and and. So, from a very young age, that was the orientation that I had. So when it came to this contradiction, you know, my orientation was to the principles and the consistency. Uh, You know, that and and the conversation that I told you about on Saturday that, uh, of course, I knew what Jefferson and I had, which he told me, you know, in this movement, we were either mandaleros or we're patrones and I'm a patron. And what's the difference between what we have now with the gringos and what, what we're saying we want to impose? It's because we're going to be patrones. Well, to me, there's not a difference. You know, the color of the patron is not is not the difference. It is it is it is a distinction without a difference. Okay, and there isn't because. I believe in, in, you know, having studied him. So, I mean, it was a very interesting talk. I mean, like I said, that Saturday before the city, it was about an hour and a half talking about these ideologies of, you know, between Texas and Colorado. Because he was, like he said, what he said, he was more into the whole issue of philosophy. He's talking about Corky Gonzalez's vision, you know, because he, he met Corky, you know, he was with Corky in Colorado. And, you know, to me, it was very interesting. And, you know, we were freaking out because, I mean, we understood that there's divisions between the Chicanos in the Chicano movement, but he kind of explained it to the T, and it was, to me, it's going to help me a lot in my own research. Uh, the second interview that I'm going to show, I know we're pressed for time, so I'm going to only cut it down to two interviews, is Rogelio Nunez. Uh, he was in Kingsville in the 70s, and, you know, his interview was uh, about three hours, three and a half hours, 
<laughs> so we were kind of tired afterwards. <laughs> that's a little, uh, that's, that's an understatement. But no, he talks about his political awakening and, you know, how he, you know, everybody in, you know, coming in like Israel Reyes, you know, Efrain, everybody coming into this one location in Kingsville, especially when Jose Angel Gutierrez went uh, to speak, you know, it kind of woke something up. It kind of stirred something. You know, because we have a lot of individuals from Kingsville going to the Valley, Laredo, El Paso, you know, and other parts of Texas, you know, stemming from that origin point. And, you know, for Efrain Fernandez, like I said, he's one of the main individuals I'm focusing on my research. Unfortunately, we didn't get to interview him because he didn't, kind of, you know, call us back. And, um, but, you know, I just want to play a little clip, you know, just as about, you know, his, you know, opinion about Kingsville. In the beginning? Yeah. Did you just upload it? No, it's no, no it's I uploaded that one in the summer. Let's retry. Oh. Uh-oh. Oh, no. I didn't do that. <laughs> Got to Kingsville in 1970, uh, and really that was by accident, because when I graduated, there was a couple of friends who were going to the military. I thought maybe I should go to the military. I hadn't taken any college entrance exam at that time with the ACT. I thought, well, you know what? And then my mother said, no, 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 no. Why don't you try college? You know, I said, well, I didn't take any of the exam. Well, you have some cousins in Kingsville. Okay, you have some cousins that are, that are, you know, through your father's side. Maybe you can go up there and they can orient you, whatever. And I said, okay. So I took a trip to Kingsville, met my cousins, all dropouts from high school, no college in that world. <laughs> all, you know, and again, great barrio folks, great raza. Uh, actually, they had been, they had participated in the '68 walkout there in Kingsville. They knew about Mayo when they said, "Hey, Mayo this." I said, "Like Mayo what?" I, mean, I, don't, I had no idea what Mayo was. That's already been started. But they were from that neighborhood, from the barrio of Kingsville, uh, close to Jalet Elementary School, which was a kind of a haven for some of the barrio activists that were going to come out later on or came out during the late '60s and early '70s. So I went into the ACT and did well. You know, so then I enrolled at A&I, not knowing what to do, what to take, what classes. Nobody was telling me, like, take this class, take this class. All I knew is you line up, you start looking at classes. So I heard some people saying, like, you know, I want to take this business class. I said, well, you know, I'll take business classes. <laughs> took English 101, you know, the basic math, and I took a business class, and I flunked. <laughs> I didn't understand the world of business. You know. But I took a sociology class, which I liked. Kind of got into it, kind of got into it, kind of, you know, liked it. Second semester, no more business classes, you know, stick to the things you know how to do and so forth. And so then I went off. But then I had a real interesting professor, uh, again, by the name of uh, Stanley Bittaker, who I took a class from. And he's like, the professor in the Department of Sociology was teaching uh, what at that time was, was actually Sociology 307, Mexican American subcultures. You know, and he started talking about these things about. Lesson of the party and some character named Jose Angel Gutierrez, and <laughs> like you know, like what is to me it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense. It didn't make sense because I can reflect back to my high school years, and when I came out of high school, none of that was ever discussed in our school. Nobody walked out of something in high school. Okay. They walked out of head couch, but they didn't walk out of something. So I had no clue. So when I take this class, it's kind of like what I often define for myself as as a moment of like the contradiction. Like you know, I didn't learn this. In Texas history. I didn't learn this in U.S. history, and now I'm learning this from this guy. But then I also took another class with Jose Reina, Dr. Jose Reina, who taught the only ethnic studies class at that time. And then he gave us Occupy America, and what we need to read. And so I go back and I start reading Occupy America, and Joel Tocqueville is saying that all that you learned in your public schools is not true. The Alamo, well, this is a different story. This guy is nuts. Broken. <laughs> That's not what I learned. Uh, one of the memorable moments of my childhood growing up in San Benito, born in Lantern Elementary, was in the sixth grade, Miss Bright. We're all going to go see the Battle of the Alamo, John Wayne, at the Riverley Theater, which is down the street here. So we're all going sixth graders, so at the end we come out and we're all clapping for John Wayne. He's the hero of the Alamo, and the Battle of the Alamo. And so that's what I learned, you know. And so I said, okay. But when Rolf Acuna comes into my world, and when Dr. Stanley Baker comes into my world, and then, of course, in the class with, with, with uh, Jose Reina, I began to learn and meet other folks. There was a guy, uh, Abel Cavada, was in that class. Uh, Israel Zayna was in that class. And these were other activists who were already active in Kingsville by the 70s, 72, 73, 74. Yeah, so, I mean, his interview, I mean, he, I mean, there's just really, really quick, you know, about his political awakening, but 
it was very helpful, I mean, because he was literally kind of explaining to us, <clears throat> you know, you can see more online, but you know, explain to us what the process of how these individuals, these activists, you know, took, what classes they took, you know, how did they get involved within their communities, so which is very interesting, you know, it's kind of like a little road map, you know, and we were, I was talking to Sandra, you know, uh, how we say, you know, there's an immigrant uh, map that you can follow, and I believe that, you know, with further studies, I mean, we need a more f or a further study of this, but how these Chicano activists from Kingsville, how they spread out, where they went, what did they do, you know, and create this roadmap of their activism. And uh, I mean, that was practically it, you know, uh, my view and my experience was very, very awesome working for this project, you know. Okay. We have more flyers up here if you need more. <laughs> Catherine. Um, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Bynum. I'm a PhD student at Texas Christian University. Um, so when I was asked to uh, partake in this project, uh, one of the things that I was really interested in looking at were women's roles in these movements. And so um, I was really, when, when I was in the field, I was very frustrated with some of the uh, some of the people that were reaching out to us and, and were trying to get us different contacts. And a lot of them were just pointing us to men. And I kept saying, where are the women? Where are the women? Where are the women? <laughs> and so, you know, we kept asking the question <coughs> about the women. And when we finally got names of some women and, and were able to locate their phone numbers and we would call them, a lot of the women would say, no, I don't think my story is important. I didn't really do anything. And so we kept getting turned down over and over and over again. And I kind of wanted to know, you know, why that was. And uh, when we got back in, in August and I talked to Sandra and David, they shared similar experiences, that they would get turned down a lot. And so, you know, I don't have a good explanation as for why that happened, but I also wanted to say that it's very important that we try to use different techniques to try to bring women in. So one of the techniques that I would try often was to say, well, you know, I think women have very different viewpoints. You know, we haven't heard these viewpoints in the past, and I think it's a really important contribution to our project that we get women's stories as well. And sometimes they would go, oh, okay, you know, I guess I can talk about it. And other times they would still say they weren't interested. But I have a couple of clips here that, you know, I really wanted to show because I, I feel like if we get women, we can get some we can get some other stories that we weren't necessarily expecting. Um, and I chose two different women, uh, one that Sandra interviewed and one that I interviewed. Um, the one that I interviewed was Frances Riso in Dallas, Texas. Uh, she was married at the age of 15. She dropped out of high school at that time and she had her first child at 16. She ended up having three children um, over 10 years. She became active in politics because her husband worked for a garage door company and they decided to bring in the union. And her husband wanted to have her go and speak to the female employees um, of the company to get them to unionize. And because she was a mother and she had children, she was also very active in the PTA. She was also part of the Mexican American Political Association. She's very active in voter registration drives. And when, it, when I was doing my research on Francis Riso, one of the things that I had read about were these conferences that she had attended. And one of the conferences that she created in Dallas in 1977 was this biracial conference. Now I was trying to get to some of these other conferences that she was talking about and it ended up coming up with a story that sh I was not expecting to get. And so if we can play um, the clip, uh, domestic violence. They had to do with uh, reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. They had to do with the church. Mm -hmm. Uh, registering to vote, uh, getting involved in the school system, all of those things that I wound up doing. Mm -hmm. um, and they had to do with uh, some domestic violence because domestic violence was a humongous, mm -hmm. humongous issue. And it was hard to talk about domestic violence at La Razonida conferences because the men were there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I. Um, and I'm not, I'm not proud of my lying, but I had to. It was the only way I could manage it. I wound up uh, a volunteer on the task force that eventually organized the, the first battered women's shelter in Dallas that became the family place. Mm -hmm. But I would tell my husband, husband I was going to a PTA board meeting downtown. So he, he never knew I was on that task force. 
I would have gotten beat up if he knows that. So yeah, all of those workshops do we could do when when they were women's conferences. Mm -hmm. You felt like men weren't going to be receptive in some way, or no? Because a lot of the women that were having to that were victims mm -hmm. for having to survive this with their husbands um, would get in trouble. Mm -hmm. But if it was a women's conference and and it was about family and the schools and health and like that, you know, it was it was okay. But in those health education classes, we talked, you know, mm -hmm. about their rights to control their own bodies. And we weren't talking about abortion mm -hmm. because Latinas are basically Roman Catholic and more so back then. We weren't talking about abortion rights. We were talking about that that you, you shouldn't have to get pregnant or you can you can take birth control mm -hmm. and under certain circumstances you can you know and and how to how to work with the church so that you know, because a lot of the women would, if the priest said you you don't take birth control pills, by golly, mm -hmm. they weren't going to, or they they would get it. They felt they would get excommunicated. Mm -hmm. So, do you think you consider yourself a feminist? Or? Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Because in the paper you said you weren't about women's liberation. Well, well, you have to understand the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was married. And I was a, uh, a victim of domestic violence. Okay, that's why I'm able to say to you the things that I'm saying to you, and how we had to get it done. Okay. okay. So yeah, I was a feminist. Of course, I was a feminist, but I couldn't say that to a reporter. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was for women's liberation. I couldn't wait to get liberated from the time of my children. But you know, I went to the priest for five years for con for for counseling. And for five years he said, forgive and pray and be patient, forgive and pray and be patient. And it got to be like a tape recording. And I finally said, to hell with this. I was about to, I'm, I'm just, God help me, you know, God didn't let me kill him. <laughs> um, and I, you know, really serious. Uh, it was, someone's going to give. And, and I prayed and prayed and prayed and God said, don't kill him. Leave. So I packed me and my kids up and we left. So it's a little rough stuff, but I think it's an important story that needs to be told, um, especially when we're talking about civil rights and women's rights especially. Um, the next um, clip that I wanted to talk about was uh, a, an interview that uh, Sandra did uh, while they were stationed in Edinburgh. It's uh, Ophelia de los Santos. Um, so De Los Santos uh, grew up in Edinburgh, is that right? Yeah, she grew up in Edinburgh and she got married about two years after she graduated from high school. And while her husband was getting his uh, PhD, um, she was having children and staying at home and, and raising. And she sort of started to feel like maybe there was something more that she could be doing. She just said she was feeling like she was just you know, staying at home all the time. She wasn't doing anything for herself. And she kept questioning, is this more? Is there more to her life? And so um, this one clip that I wanted to play is at the Hidalgo County Women's Political Caucus. It talks about the kind of the formation of that political caucus and, and how it was received um, amongst women and also men in the movement. And then I met some women that said, why don't we form a Mexican-American or a women's political caucus. It couldn't be Mexican American because we had a lot of Anglo women that, that were at the university. One of them was the, the wife of the editor of the Monitor at the time, Barbara King. And we became good friends. And so we women decided to form this organization. Well, it created a big problem with our husbands because our husbands were Mexican Americans, Chicanos, La Raza. And so we were joining a white woman's movement, uh, to quote my husband. And uh, I remember telling him, but it's not just a white woman's movement, because Mexican American women are also getting, you know, oppressed by the husbands, the boyfriends, the men. And he was like, no, nah, you know what you're talking about. And this is an educated person, but I'm educated in in political activism of women. But we women went ahead with it, and uh, 
we started the organization and we got very involved. What was the name of the organization? It was uh, Idaho County Women's Political Caucus. And what year was this formed? That would have been uh, 1980. How did you get involved? Well, we were the founding members. No, 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 but uh, how did you get involved in on campus as a group and uh, in the community? In the community. Um, we would meet in Van Calvin and women would come from the... The women came from the different organizations that we were members of. And in La Jolla, I was, uh, La Jolla was a very political town run by um, uh, Big Leo, we called him Big Leo, Billy Leo's father. Mr. Leo was a very smart man, smart enough to understand and not be threatened by women's uh, political activism. He gave us our initial kind of like blessing, and so the men couldn't do too much about it. <laughs> um, the husbands weren't too happy about it, but I took nine women from La Jolla with me to the first meeting of the formation of the Women's Political Caucus. One of them was Maria Luisa Garcia. I recommend that you that you yeah. interview. Yeah, we've been trying to contact her, but her number's not working, so I need to re ask you for her number. Yes, I'll try to find a uh, place. But Maria Luisa Garcia. <laughs> so it's a struggle show. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so th uh, those are the two clips that I thought were the most important to show about women's experiences, how they differ from men, and kind of the struggles that they were facing, that something that would be unique to um, what men had faced. So thank you. I guess I'm next. <laughs> okay, hi everyone, thank you for being here today. Um, so over the course of the eight weeks that we were on the field, David and myself, we went around Laredo, El Paso, and the Valley. And I noticed when you're interviewing so many people, you know, day after day, week after week, you start noticing trends. So I started noticing, you know, people being connected across time and space. And to me, something that really caught my attention um, and I think that's interesting that we've all kind of been going off of what we are interested as a scholar. So for me, I'm interested in community control organizations, so that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about. And uh, I, I, it's the amount of, of stories that we got about community control organizations, um, especially in the border areas, which is an area that is very neglected by the state of Texas and also by, you know, by the federal government. So. Um, even though the areas that we studied had um, a lot of victories in the electoral process uh, during the 1960s and 70s, uh, many Chicanos throughout the state of Texas succeeded in carving out social spaces that you know, benefited particular communities through different social services when federal, uh, local, state, and federal authorities failed to, to do so. Um, the Chicano movement fueled a lot of these uh, of these community control spaces, and um, they were just simply formed in order to you know provide just basic education. Uh, Narciso Soliman is one of the the founders of Colegio Jacinto Treviño, which is the first uh, the first Chicano institution of higher education uh, and clinics because people had no services in their barrios or so just social services, housing, etc. And that really interested me. And so some of these institutions, unfortunately, disappeared when the, the Chicano movement lost its momentum at the latter half of the, the, 17, uh, the 1970s, excuse me. Mm -hmm. But so, uh, several organizations continued, and, and they, they, they um, prevailed and still continue to serve the community to this day. So something that I'm really interested in looking at after I'm done with my dissertation is the legacy and the continuation of these community control spaces and how they redefine our perceptions of whether or not the Chicano movement was a success or a failure. So the, the first uh, clip that I'm gonna show you, it's in El Paso, I'm from, I'm from Juarez, and I grew up in El Paso, uh, moved uh, like many people do in El Paso. So I moved over to the, to the United States and, and working in a Segundo Barrio for my own project uh, made me interested in this particular story. Um, so this is the story of, of La Fe Clinic. And in El Paso, Mexican Americans were often segregated to the South Side. Um, so in communities like a Segundo Barrio, people did not have a readily access to a hospital. Many of them didn't have cars, and the, and the general hospital, Thomason General Hospital, was four miles away. 
ambulances never made it on time, so people died. And as one of our interviewers, uh, our interviewees, excuse me, Omero Galicia said, um, a lot of people distrusted this institution because people believed that, quote, la gente iba a morir ahí, or people went there to die. And so a group uh, in 1967, a group of, of women, single mothers, single parents, and abuelitas and grandmas, uh, created a, a Father Rom clinic, which now is La Fe Clinic. Uh, and this summer, we interviewed the CEO, who is Salvador Valcorta. And Salvador Valcorta started as a youth organizer in the 1970s in La Fe. So he has been there seeing it grow to the institution that it is today. So I just wanted to show you the, the formation of La, of La Fe. And can you tell us about the, the origins of La Fe? for the people that don't know about it. Oh, sure. Bless you, La Fe was started in 1967 uh, by different uh, groups of parents in the neighborhood, uh, mainly the Ochoa Parents Association. And uh, they started in a one-room tenement clinic. Uh, they had some uh, volunteer doctors, uh, mainly Dr. Raymond Aldea and uh, Dr. Raul Rivera, at times Dr. Pablo Ayu would come in later on as the organization uh, started to grow. Uh, the organization was built mainly by uh, by single parents. You know. uh, they felt that they wanted a better life for their families, for their kids, wanted a life of, you know, not where their kids were not involved in gangs and drugs and violence, in prison, in death. For them, because within the same family sometimes, there had there been those issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a, a story that's told that, you know, a little girl was coming to buy some soda at that time. You had to take a, a deposit, you know, a bottle with you to get your soda. She tripped, she fell, she cut herself, and you know, they weren't able to get an ambulance in on time. They weren't able to get her to care on time, and she died. And that sparked a big uh, movement within the area to get a clinic. And uh, the women that were involved in the clinic, in, in starting the clinic and pushing for professionals to come in and write the grants and write, you know, the, the abstracts and the proposals. and, and uh, and let me say that I say the women were the founders because I think founders are the people with the visions. Mm -hmm. I think founders are the people with the ideas. I think founders are the people that create the movement. It's not the person that writes the grant, you know? Because a lot of times that happens, you know? You get the guy that writes the grant or the woman that writes the grant, and all of a sudden they become the founders. Uh, they, they were told by somebody to write that grant, unless they're the visionary and the dreamer, and then they were themselves at the grant. Then that's where the middle found is. That's why we, we, we depict the history as a single mother, single mom, single dad, mostly. Yeah. So he goes on to talk about how they named the clinic after Father Ram, who was a Jesuit priest that arrived in the barrio in the 1950s, and he just revolutionized the area, uh, stopped gang uh, activities as he was providing recreational activities for the youth. Um, so. The La Fe today continues, and they even have a charter school. The, the institution has grown so much. They provide many, many, many services uh, throughout the area. And this is a, one of the interviews that we're working on um, uploading. So it's, it's a two-parter. So stay tuned for the rest of the interview. Um, now I want to move to, um, to Laredo. And in Laredo in the late 1970s, the Azteca Barrio was one of the oldest residential areas in Laredo. And, and this to me struck because my, my dissertation is about the protection of residential areas. But the, the Azteca was struggling to, you know, to stay alive after the city had constructed an international bridge that connected the two border cities of Laredo and Nuevo Laredo, as well as a, a HUD plan uh, through the urban um, UDAG, which is the Urban Development and Action Grant uh, to redevelop impoverished areas. 
So they were trying to, they were threatening the livelihood of this neighborhood. And as a result, the community organized in hopes of preserving the space they had inhabited for so long. So in 1982, residents uh, formed the Azteca Economic Development and Preservation Corporation in order to preserve um, the residential and economic integrity of the area, as well as the cultural roots of the neighborhood. Um, the organization has created affordable housing and financial opportunities for its residents. And I want to show you a clip from Rafael Torres explaining what the, com the community organization has done for the Barrio Azteca throughout the years. Uh, so the thinking of the group was, okay, so we've done this uh, uh, work with community members, so do we just go home and declare victory or do we... Uh, get something going, so that's mm -hmm. why we formed this nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about the creation of the nonprofit and what have, what has the, the organization been doing around the community? Okay, so uh, it's 1982, we formalized with uh, you know, the usual uh, corporate uh, filings in Austin and eventually got our exemption status from the IRS. Uh, we're active for three or four years pretty much just organizing uh, uh, in the neighborhood and then uh, we're able to secure some funds in, in 1988 did some small rental assistance some uh, utility payments and uh, ventured into putting a, a pretty significant uh, several million dollar housing deal using housing tax credits um, using the help of the uh, the FLCAO Housing Trust Fund, uh, securing some money from the city and some uh, money from the state. Um, took about 24 months. Uh, we did the construction of the 50 units in, uh, in 96. And I think uh, our first uh, tenants moved in in 1997. We've been there for 17 years, um, providing uh, housing uh, for 50 families. Uh, we've built some other units with some other funds that, that uh, we've identified also for low-income housing. Uh, so in total, uh, we've been providing housing for the last 18 years. Uh, just in the community in Azteca. So he continues to talk about how uh, the 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 funds that they're getting now um, essentially also require social services uh, in in return of providing funds for for housing. So what they're doing now is using a, an IRS ta uh, tax fund uh, that you can get as a, uh, as a low income family. They're getting back some money, and whatever money they get back, they're asking the residents to put it down as a down, a down payment for a house, for school, or to start their own businesses. So they're trying to maintain these funds to be helpful to politically and socially and, uh, and economically uplift the community. So I think that every everything that we've presented so far, um, and the the interviews that we that we've done provide really exciting avenues for new research, and I'm really excited to you know have been part of this project and, and present this, and I am just you know hoping that the two interviews and, and there was many more that I just obviously cannot show you in 10 minutes, uh, but there's so many community controlled institutions that came out out of out of the, the Chicano movement because there was a lack of, or because people uh, needed to have somewhere where to celebrate their cultural roots and cultural heritage. So I, I, I welcome you to just, you know, look around the, the website and, and hopefully find your next topic. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Dr. Delaney. Yes, sir. Um, I'm actually gonna defer uh, to these graduate students and I wanna give them a hand for the work. <laughs> And just make some concluding remarks uh, so that we actually can have more of a discussion this, uh, this, this uh, evening. Um, I, uh, been, I've been studying racial politics in Dallas for about 30 years or so. As you can see, I'm the senior person up here. And, you know, there's, a little, there's no saying. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. But I will say that with this project, 
and looking at some of the things we've been able to do the, the past six months, so actually the past year, with uh, this, the Civil Rights and Black and Brown Project, I've learned a, a lot of new tricks. You know, the fact that we can post these, uh, these clips <laughs> and have them searchable using metadata is just uh, fabulous and, and fantastic. I've been doing oral histories for about 40 years, so uh, having this new technique and, and as Max said earlier, you know, before you had to literally sit down and listen to the whole tape, or 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 get it, or get transcribe it yourself, or have someone else do it, and, and the process was just so cumbersome that you couldn't get it done in a in a in a way that you would be satisfied with. In fact, the way I met Mo, for example, was that he was doing transcri transcribing some uh, interviews that Dr. Gutierrez and I were. We're trying to put pull together, and uh, and of course I, I tease him now that I held up his paycheck for about a year, <laughs> six months for for doing the transcripts because of our crazy system at the University of Texas at Arlington. But anyway, he, he got them done. But again, we don't have to do these do them like this anymore, and, and we can make them real accessible and tell these stories. Uh, one of the things I was going to do was talk about the interviews that Mo and Catherine did with the Madrano brothers. Robert and Ricardo in, in, in Dallas, Texas. Of course, Robert and Ricardo are, uh, got involved in politics. They became uh, very important. In fact, uh, they were called political bosses you know, in, in Dallas. And, and again, in terms of racial politics, the city was dominated for about 35, 40 years by an organization called the Dallas Citizens Council, some powerful white businessmen who controlled all of the elections because all the elections were at, at large elections. We didn't get an African American on the city council until 1969. And of course, we got a, 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 a Mexican American woman, Anita Martinez, on the city council at the, during the same year. And then the African Americans and Mexican Americans had to file at large suits or suits uh, to, to get single member districts in Dallas, three of them all the way up to 1991 when we finally got the 14-1 the plan in the city of Dallas. So indeed we got African Americans, three African Americans, two, two Mexican Americans on the city council. Well, of course, the Madrados, uh, one served on the city council, one served on the school board, and of course they were criticized quite a bit uh, for what they did. They indeed full, they became sort of like political bosses, at least on the surface. But in our interview, we found that they indeed provided services to the Mexican American community in Dallas, that they were involved with the NAACP, and that the, the media had really wronged them by their sort of macro interpretation of, of what they were doing politically in Dallas, uh, because, because basically they were pro providing the services that the Dallas Citizens Council and white politicians had never pro provided the, the African American community. Again, I'll show a couple of clips with Robert talking about some of the things that they did in terms of. Uh, addressing police, police brutality, uh, uh, addressing immigration issues, addressing uh, the fact that the, um, uh, addressing school seg segregation, and of course, trying to provide the Mexican American and the African American community the same services that whites expected, or just um, you know, on a reg regular basis. But uh, again, I'm, I'm I'm deferring to to the students because uh, you can actually go to this, the site yourself. So I'm just sort of trying to pique your interest here. <laughs> Go look at the Madrano interviews and, and some of the clips, and you'll see what I'm talking about. That where they're called political bosses and corrupt, they actually serving the they are actually serving the community in a way that the community had had never been served before. And so I'll I'll I'll, I'll stop there and say again, an old dog has learned some new tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And just quickly before we get to discussion, I just want to draw your attention again to the website. Um, you, I got to, you, you got to watch us play with it a little bit. But you go to the home page, it randomly generates some images for you. Oh, look, we've gotten three new likes during the session. <laughs> you got to get to 500. Somebody like us. Um, go up on Facebook, you can like us, you can follow the project, get updates. Um, when you come to the site, right, you can, you can just do a search here. Uh, you can browse by um, some of our different subject headings. There's a, a subject cloud, you can, if you want to go in that way. And then once you pick one of those, you can drill it down by 
uh, by any of these other sub-subjects, by um, locations, uh, by various tags that are involved. You can keep sorting until you find those five clips about the sit-ins in Tyler, if that's what you're interested in. Right? And, and then you can actually write a paper with lots of different voices. Uh, you could have a newspaper article. You could have, I suppose, a legal brief um, that starts with some of those anecdotes. Right? Uh, we also have a map visualization we're still kind of playing with. That's another way you can search. And, and, and you notice there's, there's some audio-only interviews. That's what these microphones are. And when, you, when we watched any of them, right, on the right-hand side, it generates similar clips, clips with similar metadata. So you can browse that way. And after you've been browsing for a while, you can go up here and do browse, and it recommends based on your own personal browsing history, just like Amazon. Right? So <laughs> we're trying to make oral history research that easy. Uh, it, it won't show up in two days at your doorstep. But you can use the interviews however you want, and the full files will be on the, on the, Texas, uh, the portal to Texas history uh, once that's going for people who do want to get really crazy with the research and have the whole body there. So please do like us on Facebook, use the project, find, uh, find new subjects, and, and let's, uh, we have 20 minutes to talk. So please, what do you want? Someone liked this? Oh, look at that. Okay. Yeah, oh, you haven't liked it yet? What? What? Wait. Are you telling you to pull your project and not like the... It was just his last post. I, I'll also say, I, I invite you all, um, if you have interviews that you want to contribute, let us know. If you want to come work with the project, if you live somewhere that we might not have gotten to and you want to do piece work for us, let us know. All right. We'd love to get you involved however, however you'd like. So you can reach us through the website, uh, crbb at tcu.edu. My website's professormax.org. You can find me that way. So yeah, let's let's talk. Yes, sir. Uh, first, let me tell you how impressed I am with your young people there. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when I was that smart, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, in three years, it will be 50 years since the United States Commission on Civil Rights had its first hearing on Mexican American civil rights problems in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Before that, the commission was very, very involved, uh, and, and we all applaud this involvement in the black civil rights movement, uh, primarily in voting rights, public accommodation, and so forth. Now, I came from Washington to San Antonio to help run the hearings on a six-month assignment. Six months, and I never left. In that whole 50-year period, I have seen so many changes so many things that I don't even know that you young people realize that it used to be a crime to speak Spanish on school grounds. One young lady said that every time they caught her speaking Spanish, they would charge her five cents a word. Five cents a word. Whatever happened to the five cents, I don't know. <laughs> but once she reached a thousand words, then she had to bring her parents in to talk to the principal. Now. I was sit I, I just spent six years in Guatemala teaching at the university, and I had the transcript. And I start, and the more I read, the matter I got. <laughs> I just I had forgotten all that, how bad it was. Now, where you all come in, or let me propose an idea. We're going to have some function. I don't know what it's going to be, an event, a conference, or something, in San Antonio in three years. Just, Father Hesper from Notre Dame was the vice chairman of the commission. We, we weren't an enforcement authority. We weren't part of the Justice Department. All we could do was gather information and make recommendations to the President of Congress. And we were catching hell from everybody, even our local congressman was criticizing it. So he said, look, all we do is we come to a community, we hold up a mirror, and the people talk, and you look at the mirror, and you see what it, what it is. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is have a conference I even thought of a name called 50 Years Later, Holding Up the Mirror, A Study in Social Change. Mm. But we need people to come and document that, not just like you're doing here, which is fantastic, but photography, recordings, everything. Mm -hmm. And um, if you'd like to keep in touch, my name is Richard Avena mm -hmm. at yahoo.com. And the reason I don't give you my cell number <laughs> is I didn't know how to use a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> When I got back, my daughter's teaching me how to use a cell phone, but uh, it would be overloaded. But if you know, if you want to reach me, and I talked to Jose Angel about it, he told me he was going to talk to you, and okay. uh, and we could meet sometime. But be a fantastic study. Yeah. What's happened in 50 years? 
hold up the mirror again 50 years later. Has anything changed? Sure, a lot of things have changed. Is everything perfect? No, by a long shot. And, and do, you know, something like that. And I'd love to discuss it with you all and, and get yourselves or other people involved with it. You know? Yeah, sounds thank great. Okay. Yes, thank you. And by the way, this goes for anybody else in the audience that would like to get involved. Please contact us and I'll give you a card too. I mean, yeah, um, I had a question for Catherine sure. um, about Ms. Riesel. So you said she, she participated in different conferences. Did she mention anything about the, the oh, or let me ask this first. When, when was, she, was she participating in women's conferences? Like what, was this in the 70s? Or? Yes, this was the one in Houston. There were two in Houston. One was in 72 and the other was 75, I think. And then the one that I actually didn't get a chance to ask her about, the one that I wanted to ask her about, but got so taken off guard and kind of off track with the... Um, the one where she dealt with domestic violence was a conference that she was organizing um, for women of color in Dallas, and it was in 1977. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I was just wondering if, if she she was at that the women's conference. Yes. Mm -hmm. She was, and unfortunately, since we've been, we came back with 115 interviews, I haven't gotten a chance to process that interview yet, <laughs> but it's on my schedule, so it's going to be processed hopefully next week, so yeah, no problem. I forgot to say that Catherine's the real brains of the operation and keeps everything <laughs> running, so thanks to Catherine for that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I just had some context for you all. Uh, you talked about Kingsville and, and its importance. Have you, have, you, have you talked to Israel yet? Yes, yes we had two here. interviews with him. Okay, he's mm -hmm. old, yes. friend your friend, yeah, he's into all that. And you know, of course you missed her, but Adelpha Cayeco was so yeah. wonderful mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, we, as yeah. we did miss her, we did miss her. We were trying to set that up, yeah, but, and, and she, she passed before we could get, get to her. Like you I had, had a chance to go back and read her history. Yeah, I had her mm -hmm. scheduled, and she canceled us, and, and we never got back to her. I mean, to some extent, we are having to work with other people's older interviews when in those kinds of cases, and, and we're trying to fold those in whenever we can also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions, comments, whatever? So this is for anyone, anyone you know, of you who did the project. What, is, um, what was one of the things that really stood out to you as you were doing the oral history? Like, what do you, what's something that you took away Aside from, you know, from the, um, like the research, what, what was something that like really struck you in doing the research? I can go at it first, I guess. Uh, to me, it was the fact that a lot of the people that we interviewed are still very active in the community. And I think that as a, as a Chicana historian myself, it kind of made me look back as in like, well, what am I doing for my community, right? Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm writing about them, but what am I really doing for my community? So that really like has been in the back of my head the whole time, right? Like the people that we interviewed, um, a lot of them have gone through so much being activists in their own communities and they've lost things, they've struggled, but they continue doing it because they have a passion for, for bettering, you know, their, their social, political, and economic worlds around them. And so for me, that just amazed me, like, that they have so much perseverance to continue going on, and that, that, that in turn motivated me to be <coughs> more involved in my community, um, especially, it, it's hard as, a, as, a, as you're dissertating, right, and, and trying to be connected <laughs> with your community, and but to me, that is something that I'm going to take away from this project and be part of as I continue on in my career. I, I think... Um, uh, at the very beginning, uh, you gave the uh, interviews of a couple of black folks talking about Latinos. But I didn't see one about Latinos, but black folks about black folks. Do you have something in there? Yes. Oh. Yes, yes. The, the majority was talking about black folks, by the way. Yeah. We, we asked most of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was sort of a standard question we asked everybody. Um, <clears throat> this project seems really timely. I mean, I, I know up in New York, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies is putting together a similar project with similar sort of metadata uh, information. Mm -hmm. But it's not focused specifically on black and brown in that sense, but it's just sort of a, a larger Puerto Rican mm -hmm. history project. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about, just to compare notes. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically on the issue of black and brown, it seems like this particular project is coming out exactly at the right time because there's been an explosion of literature recently about the black and brown experience and thinking of like, you know, Brian Fagan's work, Gordon Mandler, who came out with about four people who uh, Frederick Douglass Opie, 
between Plum State and the apple cart, and it's sort of a very unique take to the leadership of the social investigation. Sonia Lee, who teaches out of uh, St. Louis, a building about human civil rights movement. And while it's not about black and brown, it's about brown and brown, and Lily Fernandez. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brown and the women's city. city. Mm -hmm. So I applaud you guys. You guys are this is right in the middle. You guys are hitting it at just the right time. To go back to the answer to the question about what struck each of you the most, and I think David, you would Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I think you know, as a historian, we read a lot of books. We read a lot of these, you know, especially for Chicano Civil Rights. We read a lot about these experiences, but when you're sitting down in front of this individual who went through such a traumatic event mm -hmm. and they start crying, you know, it kind of it hits you where it, you know, you try to act tough, you know, you're like, you know, like, oh, my God. Um, okay, but I think, you know, when we interviewed a, uh, an, an individual for the Ed College of Walkouts, uh, we were talking about, you know, how they made him beg to, you know, the students were expelled, they made him beg to go back to class. And she starts tearing up, and I started tearing up, and I'm like, and I was, I, I, was I tearing up. <laughs> she, she, I was like, I hope Sunday doesn't see me, right? But I, I go like that, I just go like that. <laughs> but it, it was just, to me, I think that's what I learned. You know, we can read it, we can read these experiences, but until we, you know, sit down and talk to them, you can really feel what they went through. And you know, to me, that was a very, very, you know, good learning experience. And, and just quickly, I think that that's the beauty of having the videos uploaded yeah. too, because in the transcript or in the voice uh, recording, you can you can hear it, but it's not the same. You can actually see emotion, yeah. and that makes you you know connected or get connected with with the person that you're interviewing. I mean, sometimes I felt like clapping or yaying, or you know, like you you, you can hear in some of the you can probably do it. You can hear in the interviews, but I think that as an audience seeing the the video, right, as an outsider, it, it really yeah grasps your attention and it really makes you connect with the person that you're trying to study. Yeah. Um, I know for me, the uh, everything they're saying, of course, and speaking to activists who were there on the front lines in the 60s and 70s is really huge. But I also uh, found this new importance, and as my talk suggests, of like non-activists, of just working, working people, people who said, oh, I didn't... I didn't really do anything important. And then they start talking to you on the phone about everything that they saw and did. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, let's get this on tape, please. Um, and we got these, these just wonderful insights of just how things just work, like daily. Like, as people who got up in the morning, went to work, you know, 10, 12 hours, came back, raised a family. Like, I saw this whole new, I had, I, I, you know, gained this whole new appreciation for those sorts of, um, you know, recollections of, of, of that time period we're focusing. Yeah, oh, but I think Catherine wanted to answer the previous one and then I can. So let's put a pin in that question yeah. if you want to finish. Oh, I kind of forgot what I was going to okay. say. I was getting ready to answer his question now. But, um, <laughs> uh, well, what our, our main goal was to get the, uh, the most senior activists before they passed on. But we did actually do, con we, we, d we did conduct a couple of interviews with, um, I believe our youngest was 40, and he was the NAACP president of the Tyler chapter of the, uh, uh, his name is Cedric Granberry, and I believe he was about 40 years old. But that was our goal, was to really try to get some of the oldest ones first, some of the ones that, you know, within a few years, maybe we wouldn't have the opportunity to get to. So yes, m majority of the ones up here right now are older, but we also do have some younger activists as well. Yeah, yeah. we did a partnership recently with the city of Fort Worth uh, as part of the Latino Americans uh, film screening, public programming projects. We got a grant with them and, uh, and did interviews where people came to us and we just collected local history and Mo's building a website, another website that's gonna <laughs> feature that story. But during the course of those interviews, we had two different people who were either third or fourth generation Mexican American activists. <laughs> and they were both, I think the older one was in his 30s and was a high school principal and the other one was in his 20s and worked in, uh, in some kind of social service context. Um, and that was really interesting and, and I think, um, you know, as we keep working on it, we're going to get more and more of those as well. But as Catherine said, the priorities on the people who are going to lose. <laughs> um, 
because we don't want to lose them. And I just remembered my answer to Jaime's question. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> sorry, it's been a long week. Um, but uh, what I, I guess what I took away from it was just, and it's kind of corny and cliche, was just to expect the unexpected. Because I feel like any time I went into an interview expecting it to go a certain way, it always changed courses. It, you know, que new questions would be asked. They would tell a story about... Um, you know, working in a labor union, and we were like, wait, we were here to talk about this one, you know, parents organization. What do you mean you were in a labor union and you brought your kids to strikes, you know? So it was just <laughs> always like, it was always expect the unexpected and be okay with it kind of going off course and just seeing where it's going to take you, mm -hmm. so. Other questions? Yes, sir. I was just curious, um, you all doing your research and interviews, was there anything that you came across where you could tell, like, during the interviews, like you notice that hey, this is something that person said that it's not in a textbook, it's not in a literature or in an article. You know, do you all ever have that kind of experience? Yeah, I think with Sandra and now we interviewed an African American woman in McAllen. You know, uh, right there by the Coca Cola Company, that little neighborhood. Um, it, it really kind of got me excited because I mean, when we think about South Texas, you know, especially the city of McAllen, the South Side, we don't think about African Americans. We, it's all Chicano, it's all working people. Mexican Americans, but she was saying that you know during the 30s and 40s her father walked down from Houston to the valley. You know he got, went to Alice and then he walked the rest of the mm -hmm. way, and that he worked as a as a field hand, and that he started learning Spanish, you know, and he you know talked to a lot of the individuals, a lot of the older the the, the parents and his kids, you know, which includes her, the lady uh, spoke Spanish, you know, got along with the Me Mexicanos, but. What was really interesting, we went to do an interview in San, in San Benito, mm -hmm. and this individual was talking about how his father used to work as well in, 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 the, in the fields, and that they mentioned that there was an African family, African-American family, that spoke very well, very good Spanish, and you know they were always going around, and I, I kind of geeked out because <laughs> I, I've never really heard that. You know, I've never really experienced that, you know, in a sense, you know, running through that between an article or, or books that I've read. You know that it was African American families that did speak Spanish, that did you know you know kind of take in the customs you know of the Mexican American culture. Mm -hmm. Children did play it along together, but I mean of course it was like one one or like maybe about one percent, you know the the population. But still, I mean it was something. That's what I took away from it. Hmm. Anyone else want to comment on that? Trying to think. <laughs> I mean there was just a lot of that really. Yeah. <laughs> it's like. You know, um, I always walked away from every interview. I always said, wow, I learned a lot. And I, it, it's, it wasn't just a formality that I, you know, wrapped up interviews. It, I really did just, you know, learn so much. I would end, you know, the interviews with pages of notes. And, um, yeah, things would just, I, going off of what Catherine said, like, we would walk away with more questions sometimes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, things that, you know, we didn't originally expect to hear from, you know, newspapers or that sort of thing that yeah. just pop up out of nowhere. I have another question about about like the, the technical aspects of doing the interviews. How did so y'all worked in teams, right? Mm -hmm. Y'all did two to each area, right? Mm -hmm. So how did you decide who was going to do what which interview? Like, did you? <laughs> <laughs> it just depends. Like Not sometimes, uh, well, I can answer. No, we well sometimes we like in Laredo we just didn't have like the knowledge so we were really afraid and we were trying to catch up on everything that we could right uh, on on literature and on people so sometimes like we would just be like okay it's your turn or it's my turn or how about your lunch like or <laughs> or if we were interested or had a previous knowledge about that particular subject and then uh, this came when you know david's doing research in mccall and and south texas and the valley and i'm doing research in el paso so most of the el paso interviews were done by me whereas like you know mo all, not most but like a lot of them were done by david and, and it's just depending on the interests and stuff of, and, and also i think i think you know the issue of gender also yeah, came in so where, 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 like when they were, we had an interview about talking about women's studies or or, or you know i had her tell me of course because i wouldn't know you know what to ask you know if i did ask them probably sound wrong <laughs> so i mean it also depend on that but i mean other than that i mean we yeah. would just uh we would rotate we would, mm -hmm. or we just do paper rock scissors sometimes <laughs> <laughs> moises and i had a pretty good system where we just alternated back and forth so i would do one he would do the next and unless there was an interview that we worked really hard to get or maybe we had more knowledge about a certain subject than another 
um, sometimes we would go back to back, but most of the time we would alternate, and it worked out. I think it worked out very well. I don't want to speak for you, but I agree. Yeah, completely. So. Yeah. And I also think that having the small group, right? And like it, the process of doing the interview kind of seemed intimidating because we had a camera, microphones. You know, they had lapel uh, microphones on them, and so people were sometimes intimidated. But then after a while, they forgot about the camera, mm -hmm. and just having the two people. I think that if it were more than like three, four, five, then people would not have yeah. gotten um, the same experience. But, you know, the, the good thing about having a team, you know, having a partner was that if you missed something or like if you didn't go back to it, then the other person picked it up and then we would go, you know, and, and, and probe that question. So it, it was really, even though someone was leading the, the interview, it was a team effort too. Yeah, I think we would either pass papers to each other or we like, yeah, you know, there's a, a, like, a natural break, like, you know, can I come in? And, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, yeah, it's really, really nice. Any other comments? Questions? Very good. Oh, 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 How well funded is this project? I, I, I got it. <laughs> you got to talk to him. Uh, well, here you go. Uh, <laughs> taken a lot of contributions from lots of different institutions and people. Um, so we, you know, and, yeah, and students and everybody else. Um, you know, we, we were able to do this with, with private funding um, that we had raised from these foundations and then also from our in-kind contributions from the universities. Uh, and, and so this, we just got awarded the NEH grant uh, from their collaborative research program to the tune of $200,000. Uh, and we're raising matching funds for that. So altogether, I think we'll be probably close to half a million of external funds raised when we're all said and done. And then, of course, there's all kinds of in-kind. So we're going to have a... We're going to have a symposium in which we, we're, we're, we're creating a, a multi-authored book out of the project. Uh, and we're going to have a symposium of the web, uh, Walter Prescott Web Lectures at UT Arlington, which has its own large budget that they've donated to us for an entire year to, to work on the project. So, um, you know, the Portal to Texas History is contributing. We've gotten sourced all kinds of different contributions. Um, yeah, <laughs> we, we, uh, yeah. Cool. yeah. We we, I think we will. But I mean, as you can see, we have a thousand clips on here right now, and um, and 99 interviewees, and out, you know, probably half of those are from older projects, not even from the summer work. So we have a long ways to go in building I, it still. I think if I dig around in my boxes, I might find a bunch of interviews. I might even have one with a notebook I so, uh, we, would, we would love any contributions from, from all of the I want that. Uh, you know, Brian Bankin gave us his interviews. A lot, a lot of people are, are giving us interviews, and we're trying to figure out how to, how to streamline our processing operation. But TCU's library has been a huge contributor of resources of people um, and, and, and equipment and so forth. Uh, our college bought us equipment. Um, because apparently the, the liberal arts people never ask for money for equipment. So they're like, yay, somebody has an equipment. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it, we've been fortunate to, to do that uh, and to get so much support from, from, our, from our homes. Um, and, and we really want uh, it to be a statewide study, uh, to be comprehensive and probably maybe someday beyond that. <laughs> um, and, and for it to be inter-institutional, uh, Maggie Rivas Rodriguez is joining us as another collaborator. Um, you know, we're, we're hiring students, as you can see, from all over the state, and we hope to continue to do that. And, and really, um, you know, not just for our own largesse, but rather because we, we value local knowledge, right? That's what the program's all about. And, and so we want people who have done the work before us to, to contribute any way they can. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, I think we can stop there and just thank all of you for spending your afternoon with us and thank you very much for Not that, not that, not that, not that, not that, not that. I know, right? <laughs> I know, I kind of jotted some notes down in that last session, yeah. so I would have something to say. Oh. But yeah, yeah. Uh, it, no, there's a, come here. Oh, my not script, so don't.